Hi there, my name is Bruce Webster. My presentation today is intended to help you if you want to work information about nuclear strategy and nuclear weapons into your stories and novels. Obviously, in the space of 40 minutes, it can't be comprehensive, but there's plenty of information on these slides. There'll be a list of references at the end, and I think it'll be enough to get you thinking about your particular approaches. I'm going to turn off that pesky webcam because it looks awkward as hell. Uh, okay, Sun Tzu. Everyone's heard of Sun Tzu. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people have never actually read him, and I, yeah, I'm always amused to see quotes that I know he never said attributed to him. But 2,500 years ago, what wrote one of the great classic works on conflict and strategy, and that's where the title of my presentation comes from, The Field of Life and Death. And there are a few things that better embody the field of life and death than the potential use of nuclear weapons. Sun Tzu, of course, did not have to deal with nuclear weapons. Now I'm going to show you a video clip here. This is ancient technology. This is Operation Crossroads in the South Pacific, the Baker Test Blast. It's in mid-1946. It's a 21 kiloton device underwater. You can see the column. You can see as a column collapses, what's called the base surge, which is this, this absolute wall of steam and sand and water that is enveloping the ships. My father was there. He witnessed these blasts. He was part of the teams that went aboard these ships to see what damage had been done, to see whether they could be decontaminated. It was eventually determined that a couple of the ships were that were further away were eventually decontaminated, but it was determined not just not to be practical. Again, here you can see the blast surge that's going out and enveloping and making the ships disappear. Again, this is 75 years ago. This is a primitive nuclear device, and it is still awe-inspiring to see what, how it works. Sun Tzu devotes an entire chapter in The Art of War talking about using wildfire as an offensive weapon, best seasons to do it, where to light the fire, and so on. Nuclear weapons have their own form of wildfire. First, literal wildfires at the point of impact, depending upon the vegetation and the surrounding terrain, and fallout that can drift for miles or hundreds of miles and have a ongoing impact. Now, Bruce Henderson and I are working on a series of novels that involve, among actually many other things, the domestic detonation of nuclear devices here within the continental US. Because of this, we've done a lot of research on this. Part of that research, as, as I note in the point here, was that I actually took a full semester long seminar on nuclear strategy and American diplomacy talked by Dr. Kerry Karchner, who himself worked for both the Pentagon and the State Department doing US arms control and verification. He, uh, he actually traveled to the Soviet Union to visit nuclear weapons locations and verify what was and was not there and so on. So it was <clears throat> that was a tremendously useful class. I still have half a dozen books from it. But and and because of that, this presentation came about because I know that a lot of you want to write and write intelligently about nuclear weapons. Now, in 1946, the same year as the nuclear test we witnessed, and a year after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, two major schools of thought of nuclear strategy emerged. And they remain to this day, and they remain in conflict to this day. The first is assured destruction. Bernard Brody wrote a book called The Absolute Weapon, in which he outlined this. His argument was that the only sane policy was one of countervalue which is, I say to you, if you ever attack me, I'm gonna target every single nuclear weapon I have at your cities, your civilian population, your farms, your factories. I will wipe you out as a nation and as a people. And I'm gonna build up a large number of nuclear weapons with high yield so that I can do that. This has been dominant in many respects. Well, we'll talk about the policies over the years, but this is this is why there is such 
intense opposition to missile defense systems because they basically destabilize it. They create the risk and the image that yes, we can actually survive an AD policy because we can get our nukes off and we'll keep you from using a counter value strategy. Same year, 1946, William Borden writes, there will be no time. And his policy is one of damage limitation or counterforce, which means you do not target civilians. You do not target cities. You do not target factories. You do not target farms. You target the enemy's remaining nuclear weapons. If they haven't launched at all, you want to target all of them and simply knock them out before they ever get used. Now, the idea here, the difference between this and, and counter value or assured destruction is that you want mid range or tactical weapons, very quick flight time, very short, you know, very short flight time from where they're launched to where they hit with low yields that are basically just wiping out nuclear weapons delivery sites, air bases, missile silos, so on and so forth. The idea is that you have a limited nuclear intervention to start with, to cripple the other side's nuclear capabilities, and then hopefully de-escalate. Now, assured destruction was a policy that the US adopted initially, and we'll see that in a later slide. The goal for counter value for assured destruction was you wanted to wipe out 50% of the civilian population and about a third of industry. The force required was 400, the estimate, that was calculated by Robert McNamara, a name some of you may recognize, was 400 equivalent megatons. Now the EMT means actual megatons you can deliver to target. There are a couple of problems that, that cropped up here. First is that the rough odds of a nuclear weapon making it to its target are about 50%. So if you're trying to deliver 400 equivalent megatons, you actually need 800 deliverable megatons to have that impact because you're going to have things that don't launch, planes that don't get off the ground, weapons that are destroyed while still in, in the air on a plane or a missile or in the ground, and devices that just don't fire off when they, when they hit their target. Then both the Navy and the Air Force each wanted their own nuclear arsenals and they both wanted to have that 400 survivable equivalent megatons. So suddenly we went from 400 equivalent megatons to 1600 equivalent megatons, which worked out to about 30,000 warheads. And of course, if, defer if deterrence doesn't work out, we're all dead. Borden and his followers are still preaching damage limitation with the idea of focus on the ability to destroy weapons, either on the ground or in flight, destroy hardened targets, take out the enemy's ABM systems. The force required wasn't based on eliminating millions of civilians. It was based on the opponent, where their weapons were, what the types were, and how to best take them out. And the idea is that if diplomacy fails, use a counterforce strike to keep the enemy from attacking you. Now, this was the consequence of adopting the assured destruction policy in the US. You can see the run up of nuclear warheads that from 45 to 65, we basically built 30,000 nuclear warheads. The Soviets were way behind. Uh, they, they had much fewer ones or there, there, there was no missile gap. There was no bomb gap. We had the ability to destroy them multiple times over. Now, by the late 60s, we decided it was time to start reducing our nuclear forces. Uh, we have a little bump up there in the mid 70s, but other than that, we started a downward trend. Soviets were having none of it. They were continuing to build up. They finally passed us up in terms of the number of warheads in around 1978 and kept doing so. And it wasn't until the late 80s that the Soviets finally agreed with the US to continue to draw down. You can see that they drew down and our own stockpile took a dramatic drop. And by the early 2000s, we were roughly at parity in terms of the number of uh, stockpiled active warheads. There's still a lot of retired warheads out there and we have a whole arms control system to 
monitor those and make sure they are not usable and not being deployed. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the details of these next two slides. You'll have the slides. You can go through them. You can read them. You can do your own research and so on. A couple things I do want to point out. First, the reason why Sputnik was so terrifying when it launched was not because somehow we were losing the space race or somehow Soviets were making greater progress in science. It's that prior to the launch of a actual satellite, the only way you could get nuclear bombs between the US and Russia were, were by and large via planes. Uh, if you go read the book or watch the movie Failsafe, you had these nuclear bombers that were going to go over the pole and do things. We didn't even have ICBMs at that point. I uh, remember our, our space program was still was still sort of getting off the ground. But with Sputnik, you could basically put a nuclear bomb in orbit. It would circle the Earth every 30 minutes and it could just basically, or every 90 minutes, but basically it could drop a bomb in an unstoppable fashion at any time with no warning. Now, the, generally, one of the most interesting things I discovered in this class and in all the reading is that first, really starting with Kennedy and going on, there was more and more push to try and get to flexible response. They kept falling back to assured destruction simply because it was easier to implement. The other thing that's really stuck out for me was that there isn't that much policy difference in nuclear strategy and deployment between administrations, regardless of the party. In other words, you go from Democrats to Republicans to Democrats, Republicans to Democrats, Republicans. And the policy stays pretty much the same. However, when we get into the 70s and 80s, we begin to see the emergence of China's nuclear power and proliferation under uh, states that aren't supposed to be proliferating. As shown by the slide, you see the real drop in both Soviet, uh, actually, and then Russian, and U.S. stockpiles starting under Bush 41 and continuing on. You have Increasing proliferation, but not nearly at the rate that was originally feared. You do have President Obama shortly after taking office calling for global disarmament. And by the start of his second term, he's basically given up on that because the Russians just aren't moving on that. Trump's policy was focusing on re on modernizing the U.S. nuclear arsenal. Again, we haven't been doing testing since 1993. So the issue is, do we know these weapons will even work? What technologies have we developed in the meantime? There is a point counterpoint going on that was going on between his administration, between Russia. And he did make a call in 2018 for Russia and China to sit down for arms limitation, and they both ignored him because neither has any intention of limiting their nuclear arms. It's unclear what uh, the Biden administration's nuclear policy is going to be, but if history is any indication, whatever the president may say behind the scenes, it's actually not going to change much. Now we come to one of the more interesting aspects of the assured destruction philosophy, the so-called nuclear taboo. The idea here is that no one dares to use nuclear weapons in a conflict because then the whole world will end. Now, actually, nuclear weapon use has been debated through a number of conflicts, as you can see by the slide. But even in those cases, it's always been held off. It's always been seen as just, this is going to break everything and so on. Here is the issue. If nuclear weapons are ever used without major escalation, the nuclear taboo is going to be broken because people will say, oh yeah, we got away with it. Yeah. We launched a nuke and we took out this city and you know, the world didn't end. Everyone, you know, the other Seven billion people are pretty, pretty much unaffected by it. This is one of the <clears throat> things we are exploring in our novels, that when you have a limited use of nuclear weapons with no escalation, 
what happens? What are the geopolitical implications? Now, here are the standard nuclear war scenarios that are wargamed on a national level here. The first is classic preemptive nuclear strike, counterforce or countervalue. Counterforce means you're trying to take out the other country's military assets, <coughs> assets and specifically their nuclear assets. Countervalue means you're wiping out their civilians. You're, you're burning cities to the ground, you're killing farmers, you're killing factory workers and farms and factories and so on. The second is limited nuclear use in a very deliberate aggressive attack. This is the uh, for example, if you had back in the Cold War the uh, Soviets moving into Europe in warfare, they might launch some tactical nukes to take out military defense positions. Similarly, the first nuclear use in escalating biological, chemical, or conventional attack is sort of the opposite. If the Soviets are doing a, we're back in the 60s and 70s, we're pouring through the Fulda Gap into Western Europe with tanks and other forces, then you'd have tactical nukes that would basically try to blunt the Soviet attack. This fourth point puzzled me at first when Dr. Karshner brought it up, the idea that a cyber attack could provoke a nuclear response, but there, this is actually part of the US nuclear response position. And I later read a GAO, General Accounting Office report that talked about the poor IT security of various US weapons and military systems. There's a well-known novel about this called Ghost Fleet that has to do with Chinese manufactured components being used in US weapon systems and being remotely disabled. So in theory, a sufficiently massive cyber attack could provoke a nuclear response. Catalytic is where you've got two parties who are fighting and the, a third party intervenes with a limited nuclear response to try and bring it to an end. You have the classic accidental launch or detonation or false warning of launch or attack. This is the fail safe scenario and any number of scenarios and some very close real world, world incidents in the 70s and 80s and 60s. And then you have a terrorist attack. This is one we tend to focus on the most. This is Some of All Fears by Tom Clancy. This is actually one of the hardest ones because trust me, everyone, everyone, all the is looking closely at any terrorist group that's trying to get its hands on nuclear weapons. Now there are four major regions of nuclear tension. The first, and we'll talk about it in more detail, is India versus Pakistan. Dr. Karshner felt this is the most likely scenario for use of nuclear weapons anytime in the near future. And we'll talk in more detail. I've got, I've got two slides to talk about that. The one we do tend to focus on the most is the Middle East. Israel has nukes. Uh, they're prepared to deny nukes to other countries. A lot of us don't re remember how small Israel is. Israel is one-tenth the size of the state of Utah. Israel is basically the size of the Wasatch Front from Ogden down to Spanish Fork. And as a result, we don't appreciate just how fragile they feel in terms of their ability to deal with the various countries that surround them. Another core conflict there are the Shia versus the Sunni. These are the two major divisions in Islam. Iran wants nukes. Saudi and Iran is, is Shiite. Saudi Arabia, who's Sunni, doesn't want Iran to have nukes. And they likely have been the ones who have been underwriting the Pakistani nuclear program. And, and as part of that, may actually have access to Pakistani nukes. So the Middle East remains very tense for a number of reasons. Uh, there have been some political realignments going on over the last year. Uh, under the prior administration that have probably eased a lot of those tensions.
but the core one is still Iran versus everyone else. Russia in the near abroad, uh, meaning the, 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 that's the Russian term for the countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union and they think should be still part of the Soviet Union. Uh, Russia, <laughs> for all of Russia's complaints about the U.S. work on missile defense, Russia has probably the finest missile, mission def, missile defense system in the world, mostly around Russia, and has also heavily invested in tactical nuclear weapons, again, in violation of the INF. Uh, this is one of the reasons why the Trump administration said, you know, if you guys aren't going to live up to it, we aren't either. The, uh, the U.S. had eliminated most tactical nuclear weapons, but they started under Trump redeveloping them in order to respond to a potential Russian attack of Europe because you don't want to launch ICBMs with MIRVs, with multiple independent reentry vehicles, with multiple more warheads, because that leads you to a true counter value exchange. The irony is that you now, the Trump administration was starting design of nuclear weapons that could be placed on subs so that the subs could be positioned off Europe and should there be a Soviet invasion or Russian invasion of Western Europe or even Eastern Europe, the US could respond. Again, it's unclear what of that will go forward under the Biden administration. The uh, one of the more intriguing areas, of course, is East Asia, notably China, Korea, and Japan. China is very aggressively building up its nuclear arsenal. It has no interest in arms limitation or arms control. North Korea has been relatively quiet for the last year or two. Doesn't seem to be making much progress. The thing that China is truly terrified of is that Japan is a country of exquisite engineering. The estimate is they could build nuclear working nuclear weapons within months at the very least, within weeks possibly, and that they own 40 tons of weapons grade plutonium. Now, most of that is actually being held in uh, the United Kingdom and in France, but they have more than enough weapon grades plutonium and they have all the skill and engineering and other materials that they could they could build their own nukes very, very quickly. That's what terrifies China more than anything else, more than the U.S. They're terrified of a nuclear Japan. There's a lot of bad blood between China and Japan. Now, Dr. Karchner in class talked about his theory that he felt the if nuclear weapons are ever used in the near future, it'll probably be between India and Pakistan. Let's talk about these reasons. First is that literally from the time Pakistan came into existence in 1947, there have been profound border disputes between it and India. Uh, both sides have nuclear weapons. Uh, both sides have fought multiple wars. These, 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 are, these are, you know, we have never fought a war directly against Russia or the Soviet Union. Done some proxy wars, but we've never fought wars against them. India and Pakistan are right next door to each other and have fought several wars. It is, if, it is as if the US and Mexico, who did have their last war back in the, the mid 1800s, had fought several wars since then and had fought wars with modern military equipment. There is a mismatch in that with India, the civilians control the government. In Pakistan, it's controlled by the military. And Pakistan, in terms of their, their, the stability of their government is considered a failing state. They're considered a state that has an unstable government that doesn't have good continuity of leadership and so on. Now, once again, India has suffered multiple very serious terrorist attacks based out of Pakistan. So you have very, very active hostility there. Now, to make it worse, you have this, this mutually destabilizing military postures. India, some years ago, devised what they called their cold start strategy, which is that in the event of a, another war with Pakistan, they have all their military, they have certain military forces pre-positioned 
along the border with Pakistan so that they can immediately move into Pakistan. Now, the Pakistani in response to that said, oh, that's fine. Then we're going to deploy some of our short-range nuclear weapons and aim those at those pre-positioned military targets. So if you start to cross the border, we're going to nuke you. And India said, that's fine. We're going to develop some long-range nuclear weapons that are over on the other side away from Pakistan. And if we're going to move in, we will launch those and take out your short-range nuclear weapons before we move in. Now, both countries are have nuclear weapons in defiance of non-proliferation treaties, international pressure. And here is the irony. There is a U.S. is a party to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. They are also a party to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Act, which basically constrains any signatory to what aid that they can give to other nations that are not signatories in terms of proper and safe handling of nuclear weapons. So the U.S. literally cannot send advisors in to India or Pakistan to say, let us tell you how to avoid accidental launch, accidental detonation, misuse, theft, and so on. And of course, both India and Pakistan have complicated relationships with the U.S., uh, the, uh, which, which limits our ability to simply do it by diplomatic jawing. The two countries are asymmetrical. Again, it's, it's much like the U.S. and Mexico. If you can imagine Mexico having nuclear weapons, launching terrorist attacks into the southern U.S. and uh, being controlled by a government <laughs> or military <laughs> or being controlled by the drug cartels, which is almost the same thing. The, these, these asymmetries between the two sides, you know, India is wealthier, it's more stable, it's democratic, and frankly, it has bigger and stronger military. Pakistan is run by the military. They have, you know, they are a base of terrorist operations into India and so on. So this is a, this makes it harder for the two sides to come to any kind of agreement. And then the last point is that both sides have enormous national prestige tied up in their nuclear forces. The mountain where Pakistan detonated within the mountain, its first nuclear weapon, is a national park. And the day that they the, the day of the year that they did that destination is a national holiday. It would be as if, say, the US had the detonation of the first nuclear bomb uh, in White Sands as a, as a national holiday that is celebrated and commemorated and you have you know coins and you have banners and you have flags and so on. So this is a highly unstable situation. If you're looking for scenarios for, for nuclear exchanges, this is a very credible one and this gives you a number of ideas as to just how that might come to pass. Now let's talk about some of the things that people tend to overestimate or occasionally underestimate with regards to an actual nuclear detonation. First is the area of destruction. If you've ever used one of the online simulators that said, you know, I want a one megaton bomb, I'm going to drop it right here in my hometown, let's see what the effects are. You may be surprised at how limited the effects are. You may think it's going to go on for miles and it's actually pretty localized. That's because all the effects, the, the radiation, the initial radiation burst, the heat, the shock wave, everything else fall off generally at an inverse square rate. Keep in mind, we had lots of open air tests and lots of observers who stood around with, you know, <clears throat> darkened glasses and, and watched them without being blown away. EMP is a big and popular aspect of nuclear blast, but the fact is, if you have a ground based blast, the EMP effect is quite limited. Uh, the most, the, the real effective. Uh, EMP blasts appear to be, though there's, there's still some dispute over this, something that's up at the edge of the atmosphere. Uh, the general theory is that there is sort of a multiplier effect at that altitude and you get a, a wide area EMP. There's been some dispute about that, 
but that seems to be more of it. Whereas the EMP and and it's, a lot of it is based on the so-called Starfish space nuclear test that happened uh, back in I think the 60s. The so we, we there's a tendency to overstate the nuclear EMP effects. We tend to make fun of duck and cover. It's actually really good advice. If you're not so close to the blast that you're just going to get fried or killed by the overpressure immediately, duck and cover is great advice. Uh, you see the flash and what you want to do is protect yourself from further heat, from alpha and beta particles, from projectile de debris, fall to the ground, get underneath something, cover your head, uh, brace yourself. We have the nuclear winter. Now, this is a hypothesis, I think, in the 80s with Carl Sagan at all. The basic hypothesis, and people just assume this is proven or this is real, and the truth was it was criticized almost immediately, and subsequent things have said, no, it's probably not going to happen. The idea with nuclear winter is if we have a full-blown nuclear exchange, you're going to have these wildfires that go, you know, stretch for hundreds of miles, and all the suit is going to pump up into the stratosphere, and it's going to cool the globe. Well, there were immediate criticisms on basically every aspect of the nuclear winter model. And since then, we had the Kuwaiti oil fires in the Mount Pinatubo eruption, which uh, showed that the, you know, which models were more accurate. With the Kuwaiti oil fires, we had a massive amount of smoke. This is when Saddam Hussein was retreating from the Kuwaiti oil fields in the first Iraq war and lit them all on fire. You had massive black thick smoke pouring up into the stratosphere, and there was zero effect on the global climate. The only effect was some slight cooling right basically over the oil fields, and that was it. We also have this myth of widespread fallout and persistent radioactivity. Most fallout has a very short half-life. That's usually measured in hours or days or at most a few weeks. Uh, which means it falls off quite rapidly. Now, the ground-based detonations create, you get fallout from ground-based detonations because it sucks up dirt and debris, irradiates it. So you're creating these isotopes that are almost all short-lived. And then they get, to, they get up in the atmosphere and the wind blows them and so on and so forth. If you have an airburst attack, which is pretty much what you have with, say, a counter value type exchange where you're trying to wipe out cities and civilians, you get almost no fallout because it's an airburst. It happens up in the air. You don't have the great mushroom cloud that soaks stuff up. Instead, you have this, this ball, this nuclear ball that's expanding down. You'll get some fallout, but not much. Now, you can get longer lasting fallout from unconsumed fission material, uranium and plutonium, uh, or in, in some cases, if you've, the, there's the hypothesis, if you seed the bomb casing with cobalt, you can form cobalt 60, uh, which is a radioactive isotope that has a half-life of about five years. But the problem with those materials is that they are, quote, heavy, unquote. They will tend to fall out of the air faster. The real danger, and by the way, a lot of fallout simply creates alpha and beta particles, which are typically stopped by your clothing and your skin. So it's not that you walk through and you get exposed to radioactivity and you drop over and die. The real danger of most fallout is that you breathe it in or you eat stuff that's contaminated. Because those same alpha and beta particles that are stopped by your skin and clothing if they get into your body, there's nothing stopping them and they will do damage right there, right there, cheek and jowl with your, your functioning cells. This is why, for example, strontium-90 uh, became such an issue during the era of nuclear testing because the body recognizes strontium as the as same as calcium. And those who were ingesting strontium-90, which is a radioactive isotope created by nuclear testing, were basically getting it deposited into their teeth and bones. But keep this in mind, there were over 500 atmospheric nuclear explosions over a 50 year period. 
Now, there's a good chance that whatever exchange you're writing about in your novel, now, admittedly, those weren't all at the same time. Those were over a 50-year period, but that's still about 10 a year. And we don't have these vast radioactive wastelands. We don't have, you know, persistent fallout and so on. Now, the thing I think we underestimate, and this is actually with our third novel, we're going back and rewriting portions of it, having watched the COVID panic over the last year. Uh, we do talk about cascade effects, and uh, but I think we underestimated those that were some distance, meaning states away from the uh, nuclear incident that we write about. Cascade effect is an effect where because this happens, then this happens, and this happens, and this happens. Uh, one of the books talks about them at length. There's the public reaction panic, and again, you know, all I have to do is say toilet paper, and you know what I'm talking about. You have the difficulty in coordinating federal, state, and city government responses. There are some very interesting constitutional and legal issues as to what all three parties can or cannot do and what has to take place in order for, say, the federal government to move into an area. Uh, you can expect panic and overreaction at all levels of society. Here are some reference books. Some of these were textbooks for the class I had with Dr. Kirshner. Others are ones that I've picked up either on his recommendation or on my own. The first two are interesting. Kronig is basically arguing that nuclear superiority of the U.S. can help it in a geopolitical sense. This flies somewhat in the face of the assured destruction methodology, so he's, he's clearly arguing for more of a uh, uh, limited deterrence approach. But Brad Roberts, it's very interesting. Look at the title of his book, The Case for U.S. Nuclear Weapons in the 21st Century. Brad Roberts for eight years was Barack Obama's czar on nuclear policy. So after spending eight years in the, the Obama administration, he writes a book saying, this is why the U.S. needs to have nuclear weapons going forward. Larson and Karstner's book on limited nuclear war is a series of various papers and essays talking about the potential of a limited nuclear exchange and some of the implications of that. Responding to Catastrophic Events by Larson is a great book if you're dealing with any kind of disaster, whether it's alien invasion, you know, asteroid impact, massive earthquake, Yellowstone caldera erupting, or actual nuclear exchange, because it talks about all of the cascade effects that we were talking about, and it talks about all the difficulties in coordinating among federal, state, and local authorities. The Making of the Atomic Bomb is a classic work by Richard Rhodes about the history of the atomic bomb. And the Effects of Nuclear Weapons is a U.S. publication capturing all of the data from the thousand or so nuclear tests that the U.S. actually did before halting all nuclear testing in 1993. With actual charts, tables, and if you get the right edition, it has a little circular calculator in the back. So that's my presentation. We'll be doing q and I believe, over on Discord. Uh, again, this is Bruce Webster. It's been great having you there. I, I hope you found this useful.